Our first speaker is going to be Mark Brongersma. Uh, when he was a postdoc at uh, Caltech working with Harry Atwater, uh, he did some of the pioneering work in uh, what is now widely known as plasmonics. And uh, he then came up here to Stanford uh, to work in the material science department and uh, has done great work in plasmonics uh, ever since. And uh, today he's going to be telling you uh, how that can be applied to uh, improve solar cells. Okay, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and talking about uh, our work on solar energy harvesting and in particular how we use metals or uh, plasmonics. I'm not sure whether, uh, the, yeah, I think the laser pointer is working, although I can't see it on the screen. And uh, also light scattering from very uh, high refractive index uh, semiconductor nanostructures. So before I start, I want to thank all the uh, students that have been involved in this project and also the funding over the years uh, which uh, for me initiated with GSEP. It was for me a very transforming uh, 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 experience to work with GSEP. Uh, I never worked on solar before and really GSEP uh, got me into uh, the solar energy uh, game and also later uh, uh, we got funding uh, from COWS, DOE and Air Force to uh, develop uh, solar cells. Uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, great collaborations with uh, Mike McGeehy's group and Each Way's group and the Bruce Clemens group, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the work that we've done in collaboration with them. So let me start by telling you the key point of my presentation in one slide. And uh, that's as follows here. You've seen uh, here in Silicon Valley a tremendous scaling of microelectronic devices. And We've gone from some of the first uh, transistors to truly uh, nanoscale devices, silicon transistors and electronic interconnects where the metals and semiconductors are uh, in the size of the, on the order of a few tens of nanometers. And interestingly enough, when we were changing and scaling uh, electronic circuitry uh, over maybe five or six decades, we passed somewhat unnoticeably in the electronics industry, a very important optical length scale, which, which is the wavelength of light, which is on the order of half a micron uh, or so, or 500 nanometers. And it turns out that the electronic and optical properties start to change of uh, materials. And I'll uh, focus in particular on the optical properties here. If you uh, take a macroscopic metallic object, maybe the metallic net, uh, wires you buy at a hardware store, they look nice and shiny, mirror-like. But if you start breaking up metal, metal uh, structures like this wire into tiny little uh, uh, metallic structures, uh, semi or metallic nanoparticles, it turns out that the size and the shape of these particles and the type of metal, whether you have silver, copper, gold, will determine uh, what uh, wavelength there is a very strong interaction. So as you scale down to the nanoscale, there's a very strong interaction with light, and actually you can tune at what wavelength there is a strong interaction all across the solar spectrum. And the reason uh, behind this is that if you shine light on a truly small metallic structure, small compared to the skin depth of light in a metal, so that's the penetration depth of light in a metal, the light fields can fully penetrate such a structure, a little metallic particle, and the electric fields associated with the light can set the electrons inside the metal, the conduction electrons, in motion. They start to oscillate and produce, due to the charge displacements, very high local electric fields surrounding this particle. So a metallic particle can concentrate light. Another thing that happens if you look at semiconductors, and here's an example, and you take a semiconductor uh, wafer, I don't know whether anybody has a laser pointer since I can't see what I'm, where I'm pointing. Maybe there's somebody uh, who has a laser pointer. Anyways, if you have a, a semiconductor wafer. And they're always taken up at the airport, I think. <laughs> That's right. People take up the green laser yeah, I, I, I don't have that excuse. Uh, yeah. Anyways, uh, here's the, a silicon wafer that looks nice and shiny too. Uh, on the macro scale, but as you start breaking up the silicon wafer into nanoscale particles or wires, thank you, E, then uh, you can see 
uh, uh, again, very bright colors under white light illumination, and it turns out that you can tune the appearance of these wires all across the solar spectrum from the blue to the red just by changing the diameter of these uh, uh, semiconductor high index structures. And it turns out that the, uh, the reason for this is that light can enter a semiconductor nanostructure quite effectively and start circulating, looping around inside such a high refractive index semiconductor, captured by total internal reflections and build up high intensity inside. And this could be potentially used uh, to uh, more effectively convert light to photocurrent in a solar cell because you could uh, uh, take advantage of the fact that light spends more time in this semiconductor material. So, my question is, uh, obviously there was a big impact on uh, scaling in, uh, the, in the semiconductor industry. What is the impact now uh, on scaling in the uh, solar industry? Can we take advantage of these unique optical phenomena that as we scale metals and semiconductors down to the nanoscale that they completely differently interact with light? Can we use that potentially to make better solar cells? Okay. So let me give you one example that inspired us uh, to start looking at this. And that's an example that comes out of a collaboration with uh, uh, Bruce uh, Clements' group. Now I've also lost, the, oh no, sorry, I thought I lost another laser pointer. Uh, and that's an experiment where we hooked up uh, individual semiconductor nanowires, in this case germanium nanowires, between two metallic contacts and we shine light from the top on this wire, and we can look at the light absorption in this wire by measuring the photocurrent. So here you see on the right an SEM image of the semiconductor wire, two metallic contacts. If we shine locally light with a focused light beam spot on the wire, we uh, can generate photocarriers and hope to extract the photocurrent, and the photocurrent is going to be a measure of the light absorption inside this nanowire. So if there is a way to shine light at some wavelength in, into this uh, semiconductor wire and light would start circulating inside the wire, maybe we would measure a higher photocurrent. So uh, here's a photocurrent measurement for three different nanowire diameters. And what you can see here on the vertical axis is the photocurrent, on the horizontal axis is the wavelength of the illuminating light. And you can see here a photocurrent spectra, which are basically absorption spectra, for very small radius wire, 10 nanometer, 25 nanometer, and 110 nanometer radius. And you see that all the photocurrent spectra look completely different, whereas the materials absorption of germanium, here absorption as a function of wavelength, looks quite boring. It just shows a monotonic decrease and a rapid decrease right at the direct band gap of uh, germanium, uh, the semiconductor. So these little peaked features that you see in these uh, spectra are not related to the materials properties of the germanium. They ha have to do something with the size and the geometry of these uh, semiconductors. And actually, uh, we've uh, started looking at this in more detail and found a very intuitive uh, explanation for these uh, peaks in the photocurrent. And that is that when you come in with light, and you perfectly fit an integer number of wavelength around the circumference of the wire, then the light that just comes in can constructively interfere with the light that has gone around once, twice, three times, four times, etc. And that's how you can build up a strong light intensity in the wire, and the higher light intensity directly results in a larger photocurrent. And we've uh, started modeling with full field simulations what these uh, field patterns should look like. And you can sort of see it in these field patterns that there are five, four, two, one wave, or, or zero in this case, uh, one and the left uh, one is zero wavelengths fitting around the circumference. These are all resonant optical modes of the wire that you can excite with light and enhance the photocurrent. You can actually, uh, in theory, uh, predict what the absorption in the wire should be as a function of wavelength. And I've done here three different calculations for the three wires that we uh, explored the photocurrent spectra from. And you see that there is nice agreement between the, uh, the uh, simulated spectra that tell you the absorption predicted by full field Maxwell simulation solvers, uh, that's the black curve, and the experimental photocurrent spectra. So now we understand how we can 
uh, by changing, in this case, the size of a wire, can tune where we get the strongest absorption. So one of the goals is to try and see whether we can tune the size to uh, get the maximum absorption of sunlight. So here, uh, based on the good agreement with experiment of, and simulation, we started making maps here on the left, uh, where we look at the, uh, the nanowire radius for a germanium nanowire, and on the horizontal axis, we look at the illumination wavelength. And we can map out, and that's in the, in the color pattern, the degree of, or the strength of the absorption in the wire. And you see these re red regions, where you get more or less linear dependencies on uh, the radius and the illumination wavelength, that show that there is this strong light absorption enhancement uh, right uh, when you hit uh, a resonance. So for example, now we could say, well, if we want strong light absorption at one micron in this germanium wire, we may need a, a nanowire radius of something like 60 or so uh, uh, nanometer. Okay, you can take this further. If you're an artistic student, you can start making nanowires of different size and actually visually show these strong resonances in the wire. So here, uh, you see a, a beautiful flower that's made out of silicon nanowires, and by carefully tuning the size of the wires in different regions, we could control the, the, the wavelength where we get the strongest absorption, but also the strongest light scattering. So we've thought about, well, maybe we can make, for example, colorful solar cells that obviously won't be as efficient as black solar cells, but there may be a market if you want to make uh, red roof-tiled solar cells here at Stanford. Now, the next intriguing observation that my uh, student uh, Lin Yu Cao made was that you can excite these resonances not just in nanowires with a circular geometry, but you can excite them in square-shaped uh, cross-section, you can excite them in particles, anything. And here are some examples that show the type of resonances that occur in different uh, wires of different cross-sectional shape. So maybe a square wire is much more easy to make than a, a triangular or circular wire that you can make uh, using a chemical synthesis uh, routes. So, and you can see here that the absorption spectra for all these different shapes uh, is, is uh, uh, somewhat similar qualitatively. So we can uh, think of all sorts of new solar cells designs. And I want to take you through a simple thought experiment of the types of solar cells that we're thinking about. And that's shown over here. Imagine that you uh, would make a solar cell out of a thin layer of amorphous silicon that's continuous. In this case, it's a little th uh, thinner than an, a single junction uh, amorphous silicon cell. It's about 130 nanometers uh, uh, thick, but it's, uh, served to, uh, it's here to serve a, 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 an illustrative uh, point. The question that I want to ask is, if I shine sunlight on this, uh, how much light absorption will I have? And if I, in a thought experiment, would uh, also shine the same amount of sunlight on a structure where I now get rid of some of the silicon material to form silicon beams, do I get more light absorption in the silicon or less per unit area? Well, at first you might think, well, if I remove silicon material, I'm going to lose material that can absorb light and convert sunlight to current, so that's not going to be a good idea. But intriguingly, by removing some of this semiconductor material, I form nano beams or wires that show very strong optical resonances, where the light starts circulating a little bit longer than it would in a planar film. Therefore, the absorption per unit volume of uh, silicon material could go up. And uh, here's one of these resonances that you might imagine for a square beam. So if I plot the short circuit current, the amount of current that I can get per unit area, as a function of the spacing between these two beams, where zero spacing means that the, the, uh, the beams form a continuous silicon film, what I see that as soon as I break up this continuous film in separated nanowires, then my short circuit current goes up and it can go up to 25% enhancement in the absorption per unit area. So interestingly, I can uh, boost efficiency or short circuit current by 25% while removing 50% of the material. 
And since I'm in the material science department, I realize that there's all sorts of challenges associated with the extra uh, surface that's now created, which could cause new recombination uh, and challenges in contacting these wires individually. But it's sort of interesting to think about uh, uh, that you can remove 50% of the material and get not a percent more, but 25% more photocurrent out. So uh, I'm suggesting that there may be new designs uh, for solar cells. Here's another uh, solar cell design where we did not pattern the silicon. This is a uh, amorphous silicon single junction cell, but we patterned the transparent oxide on top. Instead of having a continuous film, we can uh, break it up into zinc oxide, in this case, nanobeams. All of these nanobeams can show strong optical resonances, and just by tuning the size, the width, and the height of these beams, we can actually uh, get very strong scattering, which is shown here, the scattering efficiency of different beam sizes as a function of illumination energy. In the background, you see the solar spectrum. And here, by tuning the beam size, we can get scattering spectra with multiple peaks that we try and overlap as well as possible with the solar spectrum that will allow us then to use this strong light scattering to redirect the light, normally incident light, into the plane of the semiconductor and enhance absorption. And here's a, uh, a result of uh, what might happen. Here's the absorbed uh, uh, sunlight versus wavelength. The red here is the, the AM1.5 solar spectrum. The, uh, the blue curve is the spectrum uh, that you get in, in terms of short circuit current. Uh, with the beams, the green one is where you have a smooth uh, uh, planar zinc oxide film, and you can ultimately calculate the current that comes out of the different cells, and you see that the green beam, 19.9 milliamps per square centimeter, is for a planar zinc oxide, and you can significantly enhance this by getting rid of expensive zinc oxide and forming nanobeams in the process that can more effectively trap light in the solar cell. So this was uh, all about resonances, optical resonances in semiconductor structures. I want to also share with you an interesting development where we look at the uh, optical properties of metallic structures. And this is in collaboration with Each Way and Mike McGee's group. And uh, here we got inspired by a paper by uh, Peter Poymans who looked at the solar transmissivity and sheet resistance of different transparent contacts that you could put on a solar cell. And one could be a metallic grating. And you could ask, uh, well, metal is nice and uh, conductive. Uh, if you put the metal beams far enough apart, the light could penetrate through. Uh, he also compared this to ITO, in the tin oxide, the popular transparent electrode, and carbon nanotube meshes. And the interesting thing here is that typically you see, as for ITO, that if I want to decrease the sheet resistance, make it nice and highly conductive, the transmissivity, transmissivity of sunlight goes down. Because ITO is a little bit absorbing, if you make a thicker layer, uh, less light will go through, uh, but it will be more conductive. So there's some trade-off. Interestingly, the metallic grating performs really well. Uh, this blue curve is for the metallic grating, and you can see that you can get really low sheet resistances at quite a high solar transmittance. So this uh, piqued our interest, and then we learned about the nice work of uh, Ich Wei and Mike McGee, who made uh, silver nanowire transparent uh, electrodes here at, at Stanford. And uh, they, here's an example, an SEM image of such uh, silver nanowires uh, made by a chemical synthesis process, and you can uh, deposit these wire meshes over large areas nowadays. And uh, one of the challenges here is to get good contact between the metallic wires, because there is a, a, a thin organic ligand that's a result of the chemical process, uh, synthesis process, that sits between two nanowires. So the hope is to uh, somehow heat up these wires and weld them together to get good metal-to-metal -metal contact. So here's uh, what you typically get if you heat up a metal nanowire uh, mesh on a hot plate. Actually, instead of welding these wires together, due to Rayleigh instability, uh, uh, the, the metal wires try to reduce the total surface energy and ball up into tiny little balls of uh, silver. Now, interestingly enough, uh, by shining just light, not that intense light, white light, 30 watt per square centimeter on this metallic wire mesh. 
it turns out that all of these wires beautifully uh, weld together. And we can uh, do many uh, of these wires over now uh, square inch uh, size uh, areas. So how does it work? Well, interestingly enough, we uh, uh, got a lot of information out, out of transmission electron microscopy studies where we look at welded wires. And we were helped by the fact that if you look at uh, a transmission electron microscopy image of two crossing wires, that the wires uh, that are made in this chemical uh, synthesis process have a defect, which is uh, called a pentagonal twin that runs a defect in the crystal structure that runs along the length of the wire. And if you look very carefully, you see a dark band uh, running along the middle of this wire, which is representative of this defect. Interestingly enough, after shining light on this junction and welding the wires together, the defect uh, still, I can't see it from this large angle, still runs through the top wire, but no longer through the bottom wire which was an indication that somehow, the, if you shine light on this crossed wire structure, that the top wire concentrates light in the bottom wire, heats it up, it causes some atomic mobility and causes these wires to weld together. So we did a uh, detailed simulation study of this, and what you see, if you, in a simulation of the heat generation in two crossed wires, uh, light coming in from the top, here's the cross section of the top, here's the bottom wire. You see uh, here in the color uh, uh, scheming, uh, the red areas that are being, or this is the heat generation as the color where red uh, indicates the highest heat generation per unit volume. You see that the top wire somehow concentrates light here right in the junction where you need it most to weld the wires together. And uh, the most of the heat generation is actually in the bottom wire consistent with the uh, TM studies. And the, the simple-minded uh, picture behind this is shown over here. If I shine light on uh, one wire on top and a crossed wire at the bottom, actually the electric fields uh, associated with the incident photons can excite current plasma oscillations, little electron oscillations in the metal, and these induce image currents in the bottom wire, and just like setting a current through a little metallic wire, you can heat up the wire. Here, uh, these uh, little oscillating currents heat up the junction area and actually fuse the wires together. Now the interesting thing happens that as soon as the wires are electrically connected, the currents that you initially dr uh, were driving in the top uh, uh, wire now can actually flow from one or, uh, wire to the other wire, and this completely changes the resonant behavior, and actually the heat generation stops. And this is seen in a simulation here, where we look at the heat generation uh, near the junction as a function of the distance between the wire, and you can show that as soon as you bring the wires into electrical contact, that the heat generation first, closer, closer, you get more and more heat generation, but as soon as they touch, the heat generation switches off. And this is what allows us to do this nanowire welding in a self-limited fashion. So that as soon as you get an electrical conduction uh, path between two wires, the heating locally in the junction stops. So this is why uh, the heating doesn't continue and all the wires ball up into little uh, metal balls as uh, in the case where you put these wires on a hot plate. Okay, so you can see this, for example, if you hook up two metallic wires and you look at the, the current voltage characteristic, if you look at the resistance of this junction, that as soon uh, as you heat the junction you, and you get uh, uh, the, the wires to weld, that the resistance uh, drops significantly, more or less to the resistance of an individual uh, wire. So the junctions don't contribute significantly to the uh, resistance. And that's what allowed uh, uh, the people in uh, Mike McGee's group then to start making uh, transparent organic solar cells. Here you see uh, the, uh, the Hoover building uh, uh, tower through an, a transparent uh, solar cell. And you can see the effects on the current voltage characteristic from an original cell to one that's uh, illuminated with white light. It allows us to build a reasonably good transparent electrode that can extract the photocurrent versus the case where you put this on the hot plate, uh, there the IV characteristic looks uh, less good. So we can start, or this is the first result, 
uh, I'm, I'm putting this on solar cells. Also, uh, as a demonstration, Eric Garnett put these nanowire meshes uh, over larger areas on ceram wrap, the little plastic wrap, and he showed that if you can shine light on it, the heating nicely only occurs between the, the metal wires in the junction, and that's why you don't significantly heat up the very thermally sensitive ceram wrap underneath, so you can heat, weld, and not destroy uh, very low thermal budget materials underneath this. And you get reasonably uh, good uh, transmission across the solar spectrum with uh, relatively low sheet resistances. I think we can significantly improve on this uh, still. So with that, I'd like to conclude and uh, uh, remind you what I tried to tell you, and that is uh, from a study where we looked at optical resonances on individual semiconductor nanowires, we realized that there can be strong photocurrent enhancements in these that can be tuned by size, shape, and type of semiconductor. And this is something that we're now using to make new types of solar cell designs. And also, in another collaboration with uh, Ichue and uh, Mike McGee's group, we started looking at some fundamental physics of uh, welding metallic wires together, looking at the heat generation optically and making indiv from individual uh, uh, wire devices, ultimately uh, solar cells that uh, uh, can have large uh, area transparent electrodes uh, made in a scalable fashion. So with that, thank you for your attention. Okay, we have time for a few questions for Mark. Two questions. Two questions. One, uh, this efficiency that you're talking about, the 25%, does that assume normal incidence on the, on the wires? Yes. For, for the silicon beam array, that's normal uh, incidence. Interestingly enough, the angular dependence of a nanowire array is better, uh, more desirable than for a, a smooth planar film, which becomes quite reflective for these high refractive index uh, uh, semiconductors. Wires or round wires or either? So actually both are quite similar. So uh, it turns out that as soon as your structures are in cross-sectional size, quite small compared to the wavelength, uh, they become uh, very uh, angular independent, as, uh, more or less independent of whether it looks like a, a circular cross-section, square cross-section. Mm -hmm. uh, you mainly have to think about this now in how effectively I excite a dipolar or quadrupolar excitation. Okay, and the second question is, if, if you're producing resonances yeah. in various parts of, the, of one wire or several wires, isn't there a problem with the phases of the currents that you're uh, generating in different parts of the wire? And how do the, the phases actually add and, and don't subtract? So are you thinking about the semiconductors or the metals? Uh, I think the metals. So, it, so, so it's, it's a very good question. So there's lots of uh, interesting games to play where you go from an individual wire to two metallic wires to three wires, yeah. and all of these can interact via near-field electromagnetic interactions. And there's a whole, I guess, uh, uh, simulation uh, uh, design uh, needed to try and optimize the properties, for example, of these uh, metallic nanowire meshes to most effectively redirect light into the semiconductor uh, layer. So you can't look at uh, one wire at the same time. You have to take into account ultimately the interactions between wires. But this efficiency is, assumes that they're all in phase or not? So uh, no, no uh, uh, not necessarily. So our, our, our full field simulations take into account all the interaction of the wires with the instant light, but also the, the subsequent interactions between neighboring wires. Okay, one more question. Uh, so it would seem like in your semiconductor yeah. beams that the polarization of the light would have a big effect. So what happens if ah. uh, you account for this in the simulations too? Or? Very good, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, we do account for these. And the interesting thing is that they're both resonances for when the electric field is normal to the wire and when the electric field is along the wire. 
In some cases, these resonances are degenerate in other, at other wavelengths, depending on the mode you excite, uh, uh, the, these resonances are a little bit shifted. But in both cases, you can think of light circulating around the circumference only with uh, uh, this configuration of E and H or the rotated one you can uh, rotate around. So it tells you that the resonances nicely exist for both polarizations, which is good if you want to capture uh, uh, randomly polarized sunlight. Related to that, uh, I was interested if the, all these enhancements really work best for highly uh, dipole forbidden systems where you have effectively very low oscillator strengths uh, to begin with. Uh -huh. uh, if you go to very high oscillator strengths and highly allowed transitions, do you get the same so enhancements or do you need them? It, it, these are excellent questions, and, and, and this is uh, an area for us for future res uh, uh, research. So it, it turns out that the resonances are common between all the high refractive index semiconductors, germanium, gallium, arsenide, silicon, uh, but uh, it turns out that if you look at these modes, they start to look like dipolar, quadrupolar, uh, yeah. Etc. Resonances. Uh, some look, if you uh, look at the reverse uh, of an emitting wire, some look like uh, uh, um, magnetic, some look like electric dipole uh, resonance. So we're trying to carefully now place these wires in an environment where we can maybe break some selection rules and enhance yeah. absorption. Uh, so I think all of the. Because yeah, that's uh, knowledge a very big deal with some of the highly forbidden ones, right? Correct, uh, correct. You could so figure out how to get around that. Exactly, and, and the advantage in our case over the people that do molecular spectroscopy is that our structures are 100 nanometer in size, so we can more yeah. uh, effectively tailor the environment to break selection rules and even further enhance absorption. Thank you. Yeah, very good point. Thank you.